Hello, my name is Jeff Miller. I'm head of public affairs at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Joining me today is Carolyn Samard, Senior Director of Research at the Clayman Institute at Stanford University. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, you're known as an expert in implicit bias, so let's begin at the beginning with a definition. What is implicit bias and how is it influenced by stereotypes? So we think of bias as an error in decision making, right? All of us are trying to make the best decisions we can with the information we have. But because we're bombarded with so much information, our brains look for shortcuts to make quicker, snap decisions. Stereotypes is one of the ways that we shortcut the decision making process, right? So stereotypes are beliefs that we're not necessarily even aware we have about specific groups of people and those stereotypes influence our decisions. Okay, so now that we have sort of a baseline definition, when you think about recruitment at science institutions like the National Laboratories, what roles do implicit bias and stereotyping play? Stereotypes are essentially the way we perceive specific classes or groups of people and what their attributes are, and it influences our perceptions of who belongs in what professions. So let me give you an example. There's a famous study called the Draw a Scientist Test, right? If you ask kindergartners to draw a scientist, you're gonna have about half of them draw a male scientist, half of them draw a female scientist. By third grade, 75% draw a male scientist. And if you look at the drawings, they all start looking eerily similar. They're starting to look like the stereotype. It's a white man, it's a middle-aged man with the white lab coat, right? The little pencils in the pocket, glasses, and very interesting hair patterns. And this stereotype essentially evokes Einstein, right? So we start to think of these images that we're surrounded with in our society, and it starts to create this association. We think scientist, we blink, we see this stereotype of Einstein. So is this reinforced by media images as well? Absolutely, media images uh, have a big, big role to play. And unfortunately, what research shows is that children's shows and children's cartoons are especially good at reinforcing stereotypes. But the opposite could be true. You could reinforce the other stereotype by including more diversity in the media images? Absolutely. So there is work going on right now, notably by actress Gina Davis, to encourage Hollywood studios to diversify the role models that they present our children from an early age. Okay, well, let's get back to national labs mm -hmm. for a second. So I think what we're going to hear from the hiring and recruiting managers is, uh, yes, we know that stereotyping and implicit bias exist, but this really isn't an issue for us. We don't practice that. Mm -hmm. Our problem is a pipeline problem. We just don't have a strong enough and deep enough pool of applicants for our positions. So what do you say to that? So it's really uncomfortable for any of us to admit that we are prone to bias, right? So many of us would like to think, hey, I'm educated, I have an advanced degree, I'm a scientist, therefore I pay more attention to information. Unfortunately, what research shows is that bias is an equal opportunity problem. So men and women, whites and non-whites, educated and less educated, we're all exposed to these stereotypes and we're all prone to biases. So the way that this shows up in hiring and even in hiring scientists is for equal qualifications for a scientific job, exactly identical resumes, we will prefer the male resume. So the resume with the man's name on it will be more likely to get a callback than the woman's name resume. Okay, so if you and I had same resumes, our names at the top, you're saying that mine, depending on the position, would be the favored one. Yes. All, everything else being equal. Everything else being equal. If the hiring person has no other source of information, their gut would tell them that you may be more suitable for the job because of these stereotypes. So what role does the job itself play? Would that be true, let's say, for an administrative assistant? Uh, reverse, perhaps? So that's a really good question. So context absolutely does matter. We tend to stereotypically associate men with leadership jobs, with science and engineering roles, with specific sports, with construction, and we tend to associate women with more stereotypically nurturing and caretaking positions and subordinate positions. So for example, um, kindergarten teacher, nursing, administrative assistant, subordinate roles. In that case, we're more likely uh, to perceive a woman as, as fitting the stereotype of who belongs in the role. 
But not everyone reviewing these applications is male. So you're saying that women also have the same bias? Absolutely. We, ha we are exposed to the same stereotypes and the same images. There is no difference in our propensity to exhibit bias based on gender. Okay. So I think there's been a lot of uh, research done on letters of recommendation as well. So why don't you tell the audience and me about that? Yeah, one of the ways in which you can learn to recognize bias is how people's skills, expertise, and accomplishments are being described, right? And so because we're more likely to stereotypically view women as being collaborative, nurturing, helpful, we're more likely in letters of recommendation to emphasize their qualities in collaboration, in teaching, in helping students, in mentoring, and we're less likely to emphasize their leadership qualities and, for example, their publications. So even if you're looking at a resume for a scientific position, you may see that the letters of recommendation you're getting to recognize this person's accomplishment may exhibit a pattern whereby we're more likely to talk about women's teaching and mentoring abilities and men's scientific achievements. Are there actual words that pop up a lot? Yes, um, there are words that pop up. So in the case of a scientific study, it would be words like teaching versus research. You, you may see a pattern. Uh, you also see patterns um, with words such as helpful, collaborative, nice, and these are words that are more likely to be associated with women. For men, you may see words like assertive, confident, visionary, strategic, um, decisive, and words like that. Do you so, have this list available on your website? So we do. We have uh, these lists of words to help people. Uh, but rather than simply a cosmetic word, a fix of the words, we can also think about more deeply what are the criteria we're using to evaluate people when we're looking at their resumes and their letters of recommendation. Can we really articulate the criteria, right, that we want to hire them on? And then you want to pay attention to our tendency when we have bias to hold certain people to a different bar, right? So one of the ways bias works is that even though we have people who are qualified, we, when they don't fit our stereotype, we start kind of scrutinizing their accomplishments. Are we sure that she's really qualified? What about this? What about that, right? So holding people to a higher bar and being more lenient with the people who fit the stereotype is one of the ways this works out. Um, some people say, well, are you saying we should lower the bar to have more diversity? And to that we say, absolutely not. You want to raise the bar equally for everybody. Speaking of words, a word that we hear a lot at the National Labs is meritocracy. Scientists and others will say that this is what we have operating here. And we should be recruiting to that standard. So what does that mean to you? And is that a valid way to evaluate folks? So first of all, meritocracy is absolutely the ideal we need to strive to. What research shows, however, is that left to our own devices, human beings are terrible at creating meritocratic systems. So paradoxically, the only way to have a meritocracy is to constantly inspect it, constantly question it, and constantly improve it. Research has shown that when we think we have a meritocracy, we actually do worse in diversity. We do worse at being meritocratic because we think, hey, we're meritocratic. We don't need to do anything here, right? Yes. And so we call this building a culture of continuous improvement. It is about achieving meritocracy, and it can be done, but you have to cons constantly inspect and question your okay. meritocracy to achieve. And how would you do that? What would be a, a way that you would constantly inspect and question a meritocracy? So in people decisions, two very important things that have been shown to significantly improve meritocracy is accountability and transparency. Accountability means that we want to hold each other and ourselves accountable for making the right meritocratic decisions. In the case of hiring, it means spelling out the criteria we are using to hire in a very clear way, as measurable as possible, before we start looking at resumes. So we're not influenced by any other criteria. In terms of accountability, you could also have somebody whose role on your hiring committee it is to monitor the way the criteria are being applied. So you start noticing whether we're shifting the criteria or whether we're really holding people to the same bar. So having somebody hold each other accountable is really useful. 
Transparency also really reduces our probability of using bias because if we're being transparent about the criteria we're using and everybody knows, that really helps everybody be on the same page about how do we define success and how do we look for the right skills for the job. And that also avoids this tendency that we have to go with our gut with criteria that we tend to bring in at the last minute like culture fit, for example. Well, I want to ask you about that mm -hmm. and the gut feeling, which often is interpreted as culture fit. So is that really a fair way to evaluate applicants? So to me, whenever we hear culture fit, there is a potential red flag for bias. Because what happens is in a lot of organizations, culture fit is used as a trump criteria, right? It's the criteria we pull out of a hat at the last minute in the hiring process to justify not moving forward with a candidate. Um, and in most organizations, we don't even articulate what that means, right? So if culture is extremely important as a criteria for your hiring, you want to really articulate what does that mean in terms of that person's skills, behaviors, expertise, and attribute. The other thing I encourage people to challenge is what is meant by culture fit. If culture fit is essentially code for this person is not like me, Right? right, this person doesn't behave exactly like me, then you'll never achieve diversity by saying everybody needs to look and talk and act exactly like me. So you want to think about not just the culture you want to have, but what kind of culture do you want to have over the long term? Do you want to evolve your culture? Right? Do you want your culture to grow and move and include different perspectives with different kinds of people? There's a real sense of loss to think things thinking that culture should be this fixed thing that never changes and that we should all behave the same way. Okay, so what can institutions and individuals actually do? We think that this is actually a matter of really looking deep at blocking bias. So we can't reduce bias in our brains, right? So I can't ask you to police your every thought. And in fact, this is where discussions of unconscious bias are really unhelpful. Right? I can make you aware you have bias, I have bias, but then what? Do I need a brain transplant? Do mm -hmm. I need to constantly be policing my every thought? So I cannot police my thought, but what I can do is establish a process that minimizes the probability of bias happening in the first place. And this goes back to articulating criteria ahead of time, holding each other accountable, being transparent about the criteria we're using, and really establishing a hiring process by which you try to measure people as consistently as possible, and asking the right questions. This also means not rushing the process. It also means seeing this process of hiring as a very thoughtful and thorough process. I'm not going to ask you for examples, but are there companies, corporations, institutions that you see out there now doing this the right way? There's a lot of companies doing this, but the tricky part is bias can creep in at different points mm -hmm. of different processes. So, for example, you may find if you start looking at your own data, you may find, oh, look, we don't have enough qualified applicants. We have a bias in how we recruit the applicants to begin with, so now we need to broaden our outreach to make sure we'll diversify the applicant pool to begin with, right? Now when that is fixed, you may find, oh, we're actually not good at bringing diverse applicants to the interview process. So there's something that's happening at the resume review stage. Then you look at the review interview process. Okay, what's happening during the interview process? Is bias creeping in here, right? Then you hire the person. And once they're hired, there's the promotion process, right? This is what I mean with continuous inspection and improvement. But there are some very interesting pilots and experiments that we're running with teams, where teams of well-meaning individuals, which is most of us, get together and just fix a small thing in their process to equalize the bar and kind of reduce the amount of subjectivity. And we are seeing some clear wins with that. That's wonderful. Uh, so we've covered a lot of ground. So for our viewers, could you just leave us with maybe the top three things we should remember going forward now? Yes. Um, the first thing that I really want people to take away is that we have a sense of responsibility. This is all of our responsibility to do, right? We hear a lot in companies, oh, well, it's the pipeline's fault, or it's management's fault, or that's something for HR to fix, or that's leadership's problem. 
And the reality is, until we all own this problem, we're not really going to make movement on it. So I really um, call on people to see it as a sense of personal responsibility to try to minimize bias, right, and really question their assumptions in that space. Um, the other thing is, again, to really look at criteria, transparency, and accountability, and have this focus of continuous improvement and continuous inspection of your meritocracy. The other piece um, that I'd like people to take away is hiring is just one part of it, right? Obviously, once people are in your organization, if you don't do anything to include them and build a culture of inclusion, you're going to have a revolving door, right? So it, it does absolutely nothing for you to hire more people of color and more women only to see them leave after two years because they feel like they're not really included and valued in your culture. So that work begins with hiring, but it then continues into building a culture of inclusion. Carolyn, thank you very much. This has been wonderful, very informative and substantive. And now it's up to us to live the lessons we have just learned. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.